Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Welcome to episode 139 of Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. I'm Marcy Larson, Andy's mom. So in today's episode, you're going to start out by hearing about amazing small world connections that we can make. Even though we live in a big, big world, sometimes it feels really small and little coincidences or not coincidences bring people together. You will also notice in this episode that the guest, Jen, takes over a little bit and talks a lot on her own. I am so glad she is such an amazing woman and amazing guest because for me, emotionally, I'm just having a tougher time. As you all know, it's around Andy's birthday and graduation and all of those things that should be happening. On top of that, right now, I have covid So that's obviously not the best either, but you will notice that I'm a little more emotional this episode, and that has a lot to do with Jen and her just amazingness, but it also has a lot to do with what's going on with me. So I know that you will really appreciate what Jen has to say today. Thank you so much, Jen, for coming on the Always Andy's Mom podcast and talking with us today. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be a part of this. I think this platform you developed is just amazing. And I've enjoyed and been touched by a lot of the stories that have been shared. So thank you so much. I want to start out by just talking about how what got us together a little bit. So Jen's a fellow Iowan. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I, our Iowans kind of stick together. So I, it's kind of interesting that my friend Meredith sent me a message mm-hmm. a few weeks ago saying, send us both a message on Facebook Messenger yeah. saying, I want to link you guys because I think Jen would be a, a good guest for you. I think you are both, we both graduated from the same college. We both graduated from mm-hmm. Luther College. Mm-hmm. Jen, you were a couple of years a apart from us, are a year or two different from Meredith and me? I think a year. I graduated in 95. I think you guys were 96. We were 96. Yes. So, okay. okay. Yeah. So she's a year yeah. ahead of the two of us, but you played softball with my friend Meredith and she yeah. said, I yeah. think you guys should get together. And what's funny is that Jen wrote back and said, well, actually I know all about Marcy because my friend Sarah introduced me to her podcast a long time ago. And Sarah, another Iowa girl that I went to high school with. So Sarah and Meredith don't know each other at all. So one I went to college with, one I went to high school with 100 miles away. And so Sarah had already introduced uh, introduced the podcast. And she had sent me a message a couple years ago now, I think, saying, I've given your uh, podcast information out to friends. Didn't say who you were. But anyway, it all came full circle to lead us back together. So I just think it shows what a small world is. And, you know, I I told my husband this and he's like, that's just the way Iowa is. Iowans just know each other (laughs) because it's not that big of a state. (laughs) (laughs) I know. And sometimes I feel like it's Luther. um, But um, I'm that kind of person too, I think, that just kind of seeks out that small world experience. It drives my kids nuts because I'm always having conversations with people just randomly, you know, one-on-one and they're like, come on, mom, we got to go. And I'm like, just a minute. (laughs) So I'm always trying to make a connection. Some people probably get annoyed by it, but it's amazing sometimes, um, you know, what can come about just a simple conversation. And a lot of people know about Luther. A lot of people, you know, know someone from the Midwest, you know, every once in a while I'll be asked if I'm from Idaho, you know, or, you know, right. Is that the potato state? No. Yeah. Yeah. 
no I know the potato state. state. I was the corn state. Yeah. So. Yes. Well, and of course you, you were in Decora and it's a very pretty area of, Deco- of Iowa. So it's, oh, it's got beautiful. the river Valley and um, they call it kind of the little Switzerland. So I always have to tell people, you know, it's not like a lot of the rest of Iowa. It's very picturesque and yeah. Yeah. I remember going to visit with my mom and we were driving in from the highway going to campus and there are these limestone bluffs on the left side. And she said, Oh, Marcy, this is going to be the place. And it was, (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was just from that very first, first Mm -hmm. little image. It's just such a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And I know when we were there, I don't know if you remember this, but it was voted the prettiest place in America to watch a football game because our football stadium overlooked those limestone bluffs. And in the fall with all the beautiful, beautiful leaves, it's just breathtaking. So yeah. And ironically, I've spent many years um, since I was little in that stadium because my dad was the football coach there for many years. (laughs) Oh, so so you would definitely have known when that came out. I remember you telling me that. Yeah. Because yeah, I think so your dad doesn't... probably tried to recruit my brother because my brother almost went there oh, and was going to play football. He was all going to play football. And then my mom died and he just didn't have the heart to be able to do it anymore. So he mm-hmm. didn't go. But that would have been right around the time that your dad, I think, retired. So yeah, yeah. Ugh. Now, a lot of funny connections that you all are getting to hear about, and now you all are going to have to look up Decorah, Iowa, and Luther College, but we should get on to the subject at hand a little bit more and talk Mm -hmm. about your son, Brendan. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just start out and kind of take it from when he was born. It was a true small world experience. So kind of taking away a little bit of Luther connection as well. Mm-hmm. I was living up in Minneapolis with my husband, Brendan Stad at the time. We're now divorced, but we he was going to chiropractic school up there. And so we were living there. I was working as a nurse and it was a Sunday morning and my water broke. And, you know, the first time mom, you're just kind of like, oh, do we go? We don't want to wait too long after your water broke. You know, you hear different things about all that. So we just, so we decided to head to the hospital and we get there and, you know, my, my, uh, labor moves along and by mid afternoon, I'm in active labor and I'm kind of kneeling on the bed over a birth ball. And as my contraction finishes, the new nurse enters the room and it was change of shift about three 30 or so. And she introduced herself. Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm going to be your nurse for the rest of the night. Um, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Do you need anything? kind of looked at the monitor and everything. And then she stared at me for a minute and she said, you look an awful lot like my kindergarten teacher. And I had the wherewithal in active labor to say, well, my mom taught kindergarten for 36 years in Decorah, like two, two and a half hours South of there. And she said, Mrs. Naisland. (laughs) Oh my goodness. And I said, yeah, that's my mom. So here was this nurse who was bringing Brendan into this world who had my mom as her kindergarten teacher, Brendan's grandma. And so after Brendan was born, you know, we called our parent, my parents, they drove up and it was just very, a very special reunion of sorts. She only lived in Decora through her kindergarten year. So she moved away. Her dad worked at Luther actually. So to remember the face of your kindergarten teacher that you didn't see after kindergarten was just amazing to me. Once I was able to kind of think about it. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine that. I know. And then years later, my daughter ended up being best friends with her niece because her sister lived in Decor and they are in Arizona right now going to the same college and still best friends. So oh, wow. I still have a connection to that nurse. <laughs> so that Brendan came in, you know, uh, making it a small world experience. And there are so many small world experiences while he lived. And now I'm having so many like ours, you know, after mm-hmm. his passing. So it makes me smile. It makes me cry, you know, but it's just, it's, it's the joy of it all. So just very special the way he kind of came into the world that way. So yeah, that was, um, that was very special. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a very healthy boy, our first one. And of course we're attentive to him and we lived in the cities for about another year. And then we moved to Decora. My husband at the time wanted to come back to decor and start his own chiropractic business. So we moved, I left the job that was 
pretty stable. So I was, I had some uncertainty, but I, we both wanted to get back to our families where the grandparents were. Brendan was the first of my family's grandchildren. He was my first child, obviously my only son. And we moved back to Ducor where we knew it was a beautiful place to be great place to grow your kids, start a business and all of that stuff. So we came back and really just had good neighbors. We had high school classmates that were neighbors for a while. And they had a daughter that was three years uh, or three months or three weeks, actually younger than Brendan. So they got along really well. We learned early on that Brendan was very passive, tenderhearted little boy. He had these big brown eyes and he was my only child that had my brown eyes. I had brown eyed, I had brown haired girls, but no brown eyes. They all had hazel eyes. And now I have another daughter too. And she's got hazel eyes too. So he's my brown eyed boy, um, big cheeks. Um, his one set of grandparents lived on a farm. So he loved being on the farm, loved getting dirty, loved getting his hands dirty, just very, a very calm, you know, tender hearted little boy slept well, didn't really cause a lot of problems, was never really sick. So just kind of a great first kid, you know? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. He nursed well, he ate well. Two years later, we had, I had my daughter Josie. And then two and a half years later after that, I had my daughter Maya. So we quickly added to the (laughs) the group here and then everything started to be a blur. So you could ask me something about Brendan when he was like four or five or six. And I'd be like, um, I don't know. I had a, (laughs) I had an infant and a toddler. I was potty training. And then, you know, so poor Brendan. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, kind of fast forward into elementary and kind of middle school as he entered into fourth grade, he turned 10 years old and it was early or late October when we got a call from his school nurse. And she said, you know, his teacher has noticed that Brendan's been staring off in school and she is concerned and has some certainty that these might be a type of seizure. And so a few days later, we already had a pre-planned or scheduled parent-teacher conference. So my husband and I went in and we sat down and talked to her and he was doing very well in school. So it wasn't really affecting his school, but she had a daughter that was diagnosed with epilepsy in her early twenties. And I think they are kind of, she was thinking maybe she might've had some of these that they didn't pick up on or diagnose Mm -hmm. earlier. So she actually was very well familiar with seizures, what they looked like, the various types of them. And so that was, you're very grateful for that, that she was able to identify that. Cause I don't know if other teachers would have thought maybe he was just bored or just had some sort of attention deficit disorder. Well, and I can think that they might not bring it up either because mm-hmm. you and your husband at the time were both medical people. So mm-hmm. it may have almost been a little intimidating to even bring it up right. for her. So right. yeah, I guess I never even thought about that. I think that's amazing that she did bring it up and that she had the Yeah, it's very courageous of her to kind of It really was kind of a bold thing to tell somebody that they think their child might be having seizures. Right. Especially when you're a nurse and dad's a mm-hmm. chiropractor chiropractor. And I I don't know. I just think that was a brave thing to do. Yeah. So we're very grateful. And I, I actually met her daughter through networking with the epilepsy foundation through our walks and stuff. She was on a zoom meeting one day and I saw her name pop up and then last name I, you don't hear very often. And, um, I thought that's gotta be her. And so in the zoom meeting with all these people, we kind of made this personal connection. So we're having this conversation while everybody's listening. And I'm like, your mom was my son's teacher. And she was the one. that." (laughs) So just kind of another small world, kind of full circle Mm -hmm. event that he has been a part of. So, yeah. So after that, we kind of monitored him and we kind of noticed a few more things happening with him at home where he'd be walking and then just stop. And then kind of A few seconds later, he'd just start walking again, pick up his conversation. But three months after that, I was on a connecting flight out of Houston, Texas to Panama City for a mission trip through church. We were going down to put water catchment systems for clean water for the village people down off of Bocas del Toro. Mm -hmm. And my husband called and said, Brendan just had a, at the time they called him grand mal seizure. Mm -hmm. They call him tonic clonics. Now during his sleep, it happened about four o'clock that morning. And he said, you know, what should we do? Do I need to take him to the emergency room? You know, we kind of suspected that this was probably another type of, we knew it was another type of seizure. We knew he'd already had some of these small absence seizures. So I said, you know, is he resting? Is he doing okay? As he had more. And he said, no, it was just that one. And he is sleeping right now. I said, let him rest, um, try and get a hold of his, 
our primary care doctor and get some direction maybe from him. And if he wants mm -hmm. to see him Monday, so we got him started on um, medication and we got kind of, that kind of catapulted us into getting an MRI, getting on the books scheduled with the neurologist, which takes, you know, it took about three months to get into them. And during that whole time, the medication wasn't working. The side effects were horrible. He was having seizures every day of various types, absence seizures. He was having seizures every night in his sleep. Um, and this went on for weeks through into the summer switched him on his meds and then finally got to the neurologist at the end of the summer before school started, switched him up to Kepra. And within a matter of a couple of weeks, his seizures were under control and he didn't have anything that we could tell or see just in time for him to start fifth grade and yeah. turn 11 years old. And he was, he was so excited. We were so excited. You know, the summer he was away from school. I worked from home. So we had a nanny. So we had, we had some control. Like I could I was around a little bit. So if something happened, you know, I could be there to kind of somewhat monitor him, but then going to school, sending him to school back to his peers, you know, there's that stigma around seizures and epilepsy. And I just, I, I felt, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anybody right. that had epilepsy. I didn't even know we had a foundation in Iowa. So I was not connecting with other moms. I, I didn't have anyone that reached out to me. I didn't, get any resources. We doctored in Wisconsin and we live in Iowa. So mm -hmm. there was no connection to anything local. And when his seizures came under control with one medication, I didn't think it was a big deal. You know, I thought, here we go. He's going to outgrow them and life is going to be good. So he proceeded through the years and did very well in school. He'd had no side effects that we could tell with the medication he was on. He was able to do pretty much any activity, his neurologist basically said, you won't be able to be an air force pilot. You shouldn't do rock climbing or, you know, things at heights, you shouldn't do deep sea diving. And, you know, you won't be able to do it, be semi truck driver, but for most, for the most part, you can do almost anything. And if your seizures yeah. stay under control, you can continue driving. And so we were very optimistic and he went three and a half years without a seizure and 13 months of that, he was off his medication. So when he was 14, it was the end of February, he went to a friend's house and had a sleepover and his seizures were always triggered by sleep deprivation or lack of sleep or sleep interruption. And sure enough, that sleepover, they had Mountain Dew, caffeine, played video games. He came home, slept that morning and through the afternoon, we got him up to go have an early dinner. And all of a sudden I heard this thud on the floor. And then you hear that sound, that moaning kind of sound mm -hmm. that they make during a seizure. And there he was laying on the floor of the room he was resting in. And this seizure was different. He was tracking, his eyes were tracking with me where usually his seizures had been where he, you know, he didn't know what was going on. And I talked to him the whole time. I turned him to his side, make sure he's, you know, his head is comfortable and he's safe. And as soon as he came out of it, his hands right went right to his face and he just started sobbing. Right. And he never shared with me what that emotion meant, but I knew it meant I'm no longer normal. I have to take my meds again. Mm -hmm. I have to deal with this condition again. I won't be able to get my driver's permit. Yeah. I could just imagine, you know, I wish I could go back and talk to him about the emotion of that. I never did. I never asked him once about how do you feel about having epilepsy? Right. It was all about the medical, the control of the seizures. And that was always the goal. Brendan, our goal with you with treatment is to make sure you don't have another seizure. Mm -hmm. There was never a mental health component, which I think is maybe a lot in, in chronic diseases. There was no talk about mortality because who wants to talk about that in any right. disease? You know, we felt though that we could bring care closer to home. We had been going all the way to Milwaukee, which was four to five hours away. So we got a little bit closer to La Crosse, Wisconsin and started up with a pediatric neurologist. Now got him back on his meds. Fast forward, he had a few breakthrough seizures, but he accelerated everything he did. He worked very hard. He was such a hard worker. And that's one of the repeated things that people say about him, both when he was alive and now you know, after his passing, he was able to participate in sports. He played football. He ran track. 
He wrestled a few, t- few years, uh, gave that up eventually after his sophomore, he played baseball. You know, he did all these things despite having his epilepsy. Uh-huh. He accelerated in school, you know, after his ninth grade year, he had one of his science teachers that said, you know what, Brendan, you're really good at math and science and putting those things together. That's the makeup of somebody that is a good engineer or could be a good engineer. And that was his kind of light bulb moment where he kind of went on that track. Then I'm going to pursue, I'm going to be an engineer, Mm -hmm. but he didn't want to be an engineer that sat in a cube and just was on a computer analyzing data and doing all of that. He was, his engineer, his idea of engineering was probably working at John Deere and holding a wrench in his hand, getting his hands greasy. Um, When he got into high school, he had a couple of friends that did dirt track race car driving, and he'd be down there in the pit crew helping him out. And that was his kind of mechanical engineering. Uh And so that's what he wanted to pursue. So he did, he put his mind to it. He, there were a couple exploratory kind of classes that they brought into the high school with engineering. And so he jumped right into those and they made all these little different uh, robotic things. And Mm -hmm. I was amazed the way that he could get through a physics class or the way he made calculus look easy. He wasn't good with words on paper, but to put an equation down and fill a page with numbers and equations and things that were so foreign to me. I mean, it was no problem to him. And Mm -hmm. to think back that how epilepsy and medications of any type, whatever you're, you know, suffering from have all these side effects that can inhibit some of that growth, brain growth, yeah, cognitive development. I mean, he just, I mean, that nothing seemed to affect him that way. And so that made his condition seem even more like, gosh, he is going to thrive despite this. And I used to tell people, I'm just fortunate that my son doesn't have terminal cancer Mm -hmm. because he should be able to manage this condition for the rest of his life. Now I look back and think, gosh, was I so wrong? Right. Right. You know, (sighs) anyways, I know I was sharing with you that the springtime is kind of a difficult time for me because yeah. In his senior year, it's kind of when you go through all that recognition. I know you're approaching what would have been Andy's in your year too. Yeah. I mean, I just, my heart, all the different moments where they recognize the children. And I hope, you know, the, the class, yeah. Andy's class will do something for him because, you know, he would deserve that. But, and so there's all these moments. That are, it's hard to know because he only did orientation. He never was I part know. of the class. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But all these moments that lift and catapult these young adults into their next phase, like this independence, whether they go on to the military, they go on to a trade school, they go on to university or college, or they go on to work, you know, this is kind of their send off in the last kind of little bit of, uh, Hey, way to go. You've done great these last 12 years, you know, and Brendan had a lot of those moments. He worked so hard for a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, he was, he did very well in football. He got an um, academic all-state recognition in football, and he also got an academic all-state recognition in track. And so you have to qualify for the state track meet to do that. You have to have a 28 or higher G, um, ACT score, and you have to have a 3.8 or higher GPA. So, you know, he was thriving and he was a good friend. He was just a good kid too. You know, he had a good head on his shoulders. He wasn't perfect. He would mess up and, you know, we let him learn from that, but he had to grow into and be responsible to taking medication twice a day, getting his mm-hmm. sleep. He was always in bed by 10 o'clock. He'd come home from his practices and he'd sit right at the dining room table and do his homework. And I'd have to set the table around him because he knew he wanted to get his homework done. So he wasn't staying up late doing it. And then there were times when I said, Hey, Brendan, are you at a good spot to just stop, you know, put your homework down. We're going to eat now. So we'd eat and then all my kids would clear their plates. And one thing that touches me so much about Brendan, and this speaks to the kindness and humbleness that he had every time he stood up and went to take his plate away from the table, he looked directly at me and said, thank you, mom, for supper. And I always thought, you know what? I think there are so many people that just, that's a given to them yeah. or that they don't even enjoy, enjoy sitting at a table, sitting around a table and enjoying their family. And for him to acknowledge both the meal that he was given that we prepared and the time that we just spent together, that meant the world to me. And it means even more to me today, knowing that 
that was what was in his heart each time he just had that simple meal and sat with us yeah. for those. It could have been just 15 minutes. Right. So yeah, that's beautiful. And then he'd pick back up and do his homework. <laughs> so, but he'd have his four-year-old, my daughter at the time was four years old, Ivy. I got remarried. And so Ivy is from my second marriage and she's 10 years younger than my next oldest child, my girls. Yeah. So, but fast forward. So Brendan, we got through graduation. He actually received a scholarship that was for engineering and it was in memory and in the spirit of the life of a, a decor graduate who had died at the age of 30 from stomach cancer. And he went on to go to Iowa state and he was an engineer and the company that he was a partner with along with his family developed this scholarship. And it was a pretty good size scholarship. You had to apply for it. You had to write an essay, which Brent wasn't Brendan's strong suit. And they just then picked, picked the recipient. And it wasn't revealed until that end of everyone's received their scholarships. We have like the um, dollars for scholars, like a lot of schools do mm-hmm. where you have criteria for various scholarships and then the computer picks. Well, this scholarship, the family and the company picked, and it was announced after everybody else. So nobody knew. And when Brendan's name was announced, it was just like, I was so proud of him because I knew one, he wasn't a strong writer. So that essay must have, (laughs) he must have done, you know, to bring across this point. And then afterwards, you know, we were out in the hallway and we were taking pictures and I just, it was so bittersweet because all I could think about was what this mom had lost yeah, and now what my son was getting because of that loss. Mm -hmm. And I did not have the words to thank her because that loss is so monumental that, you know, it just seemed like insignificant. And so I remember talking to Brendan after that night and saying, you know, this is a very special scholarship, not because of the money, but because of the meaning behind it. You know, a mother has lost her child and now you have been given this gift to help you further your education in an area where her son thrived. Little did I know a year later, I'd be giving a scholarship in Brendan's memory Yeah. at the next scholarship night, because six months later, Brendan died in his sleep following a seizure when he was at college and, um, you know, just very unexpected. He was at Iowa state at the time. We were so excited for him to go to school. He made such great friends when he went and we just were, I was beside myself at how well he was doing at school. Yeah. Unfortunately, three weeks before he was set to go to college, leave for school, he had a breakthrough seizure. He had been woken at night by a friend to come pick him up at a party. Brendan was that kind of guy. And I've learned that he was the one that took care of a lot of people. He was like the big brother of the group and made sure everybody got to where they needed to be safely and that they were kept safe. Came back to bed. His friend went to the other room and fell asleep. And that early that morning, I heard another thud. He'd fallen out of bed and he was having another seizure. Mm -hmm. This was the first one in over 14 months. So it'd been over 14 months and he was still on his medication. Ironically, we were set to see his neurologist the next week. So we waited and we talked to him about that. And on our ride to the appointment, it was an hour. I was talking to him about all these things that we need to do. We need to get your medication transferred. We need to talk to him about accommodations. So you don't have your bed lofted. You can be at a lower level. So you don't fall out of bed. And I remember Brendan turning to me. He's like, mom, you don't have to worry about me. You don't, I'll be fine. And so we sat in that appointment and talked about all the things that he needs to look out for. And, you know, he was 19. He didn't need to have me in the appointment, but he wanted me there. He needed my support. And I'm glad he did. His neurologist was great and loved Brendan. He, our last words from him were, I'm excited to see you in six months and see how well your first semester of college is going. And unfortunately, the next time I saw his neurologist was at Brendan's celebration of life four months later. It's a, it's just crazy how life can just, and you know, this with Andy, yeah. just like that. Just change on a dime. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the days before Brendan died, he died on a Tuesday, November 28th, 2017. We had just celebrated Thanksgiving that Thursday before we were in Omaha 
We would go there every other Thanksgiving and spend time with my brother-in-law, my husband's brother. And Brendan was a huge Iowa Hawkeye fan growing up. And so... (laughs) And then he went to Iowa state. (laughs) Yeah. We were like, wow. And I was kind of proud of him because, you know, you didn't follow like what everybody thought you were going to do. You did something outside of the box and that right there, that decision right there showed me that Brendan was willing to take a risk. He was willing to (laughs) risk being at the rival school, (laughs) the rival state school, you know, his Iowa Hawkeyes and just to risk, like a lot of his friends were going to Iowa. A lot of decor people went to Iowa and he was going to Iowa state. So I was proud of him. And I loved Iowa state. I, it was, it's like a little hometown down there. It's like a little, it's like a bigger Luther campus. They've got all the beautiful buildings. And when I went down there with a visit for him, I'm like, I know why he thinks this is where he belongs. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And we are so grateful. He had so many great friends that he actually was kind of the catalyst in bringing together. His friends will share that he was friends with a group and then another group and kind of brought them all together. Mm-hmm. And they actually pulled together and had this co-ed football flag football team for the homecoming that fall of their freshman year. And he was the captain and the coach. And they had a friend from India named Tarek, and they called um, him Mr. T. So the name of their uh, team was Mr. T and the Fools. And they had these stone gray t-shirts with all their names. And they had, uh, it's like a fist pump pity. We pity the fool. (laughs) And they got second place. They got a little second place trophy. And after Brendan died, his friends brought that to us. And we have it sitting in his room on, on what was his room and on his dresser still Uh as a symbol of that team, because that team that Mr. T and the fools has been such a blessing to us, even ongoing, we, we connect with them still, you know, almost four and a half years later, they've all graduated from college by now, and they're all doing their own thing. They're all across the country, but we still keep in touch with them. And, and we know those are relationships we need to, I need to hold close to my heart. Right. Cause they were the people that knew Brendan in this new independent next kind of phase of his life. Right. That was just a few months, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and they did that day he passed away. He's one of his friends came up to me, says, I know we only knew Brendan for 105 days, but we made connections and made friendships that are going to last a lifetime Yeah, beyond. And, and to me, that is like, that hit me. So they're called the ISU 105 group too, because they had 105 days with him and it was just the, you know, just a small snippet of what Brendan, I know was going to be able to do in life, bringing people together, excelling, he, you know, excelled with his um, academics about two weeks before he passed away. He just texted me and said, Hey mom, I've declared my major within engineering. Cause he was thinking of chemical engineering or mechanical. And he says, I'm going to do mechanical. <laughs> Uh-huh. So he just, he just declared he was ready to sign up for his second semester classes. He was just finishing up a chemistry class that he thought he needed to take. And it was hard, but now he turns out he wasn't doing chemical engineering. So he really didn't need it. So he kind of took it and, you know, <laughs> didn't need it, but he was kind of that way about the challenge too. Like he faced it head on, just like he did with his epilepsy. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until he passed away that his English teacher in a composition class his senior year sent me his portfolio of writings. Oh, that's beautiful. And of course I've said to you, he's not a very strong writer, but, and so that was an, an awesome class for him to take. And she's an amazing teacher. And one of his writings essays in there was just, was titled disability. Mm-hmm. And he talked about his epilepsy. He didn't talk necessarily about his seizure types, the medication, the medical aspect of it, but he talked about the emotional And he talked about how, when I dropped him off that first day of school, going to fifth grade and he got out of the van, how he felt like he was a fish out of water. Yeah. He didn't know if people were going to remember all the weird faces and the staring and the mouth movements and all of that, that he did in class Uh and what they would think of him. If they would think he was weird, if they would not want to be his friend. Mm Mm-hmm. And I never yeah. once talked to him about that side of this with him. What a gift to be able to have. Yeah. Yeah. I just was, oh my gosh, Brendan, you are sharing your heart with me. Now you've been gone, you know, almost a year. And it just, 
he was giving, he gave a speech about his epilepsy. He wrote that, that essay and he had to share it with some of his classmates. So he was just starting the second part of his senior year in high school to accept that this was not, he was not going to outgrow this and, and sharing it with people and having that courage and just like, this is a part of me. This is a part of who I am and I'm going to accept that and I'm going to take it on yeah. and I'm going to live and I'm going to do a lot of great things despite it. Mm-hmm. So that portfolio is very special. I'm sure it is to us and I reread it. Yeah. But it is a lot of just the emotion about what it's like to have epilepsy and the stigma. And it's not something that we ever focused on because with as infrequent as Brendan's seizures occurred, we knew of five seizures that he had from the time he was 11, when his seizures got under control to the seizure that took his life on November 28th, 2017, five seizures in nine years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, Yeah. What took his life is something called SUDEP and we never heard, we had never heard of it. So in his passing, there's a lot of work and advocacy that I've done both with the Epilepsy Foundation and a, a foundation called Danny Did. So I just find different ways that I can carry Brendan. I always kind of have to speak and pray about, would he be proud of this? What, is this what he would want to be known and be a part of? Uh-huh. The work I do is always in helping others you know, whether that's in support, fundraising, just kind of bringing something to better someone else's life or hopes that this would at some point not happen to somebody else. Unfortunately, it probably happens every day. Um, and all too frequently, you know, I do what I can in his memory to not only help in my grief with that, but to help others with that. So it's been, that's been my, a part, a big part of my healing journey is just to be able to give back to those organizations in his memory and to help others that were, that are affected in living with epilepsy. Mm-hmm. Cause not all of them had it. I don't want to say easy like Brendan, but you probably know with your work that there are kids that have epilepsy and people that have epilepsy and they are on four or five different medications multiple seizures still a day. They have other disabilities that they either affect their mobility or their cognitive space. So absolutely. Yeah. There are so many different stories in that aspect. I'm very grateful, Mm -hmm. but you know, when I come down, comes down to it, I just think of how much strength and bravery and courage that Brendan really lived with that he maybe didn't even realize. Yeah. And if he knew what could have happened to him because of a seizure, Gosh, I don't know how that would have changed his thinking, yeah. his doing. You know, he was always very good about taking his medication. Like I said, he was always very good. There's a lot of self management that comes with that. And he was always very good about that, very disciplined yeah. with that. So, yeah, just something that just. Well, and it's so hard to when you feel like there's just not a good explanation. I think that's a thing that we kind of want as mothers, you know, you want to know kind of why, why, why. And this mm-hmm. is one that, I mean, you know why and that he had a seizure, but mm-hmm. you don't know why too, right? It's that yeah. why was this the seizure that took his life when the other yeah. four didn't? And other yeah. people, like you say, can have easily five, six seizures every single day and yes. have not take their life. So it's yeah. just such a hard thing, I think, to wrap mm-hmm. your head around. And I've talked to lots of people now with uh, who have had children die of suit up. And I always, and, and most of them had never heard of it. I don't know that any of them had ever heard of it really before. Mm-hmm. And most of them tell me that they don't think they would have even wanted to know about this as being a possibility. I don't know how you Mm -hmm. feel about that. I think the conversations would have been much different. And with Brendan being 19, the first time that we were ever told that, or somebody said to us that, you know, these types of seizures he has at nighttime in the tonic clonic can be very fatal was a nurse practitioner at the Milwaukee children's hospital. And it really kind of upset me because Brendan was 11 at the time and he was in the room and she just flat out said, these seizures can be deadly. They they can be the most deadly. And I'm like, okay, we could have maybe filtered that a little bit and not said that right in front of Brendan, but that was all that was said and Mm -hmm. never elaborated on. I was just kind of like taken aback. So I never really 
asked a lot more questions. I just thought, okay, well, it's an, un- it probably is unwitnessed. They could suffocate. They could choke, you know, right. if somebody's not right. there to position them. But I was just kind of upset that they said that right in front of Brendan. I don't think he didn't understand what they, you know, were talking about necessarily, but that was the only time that they really said anything about that. One of the foundations I work with does to work with providers to provide them with information. So that kind of bridging that gap of communication. So when parents, you know, have a situation where someone may be at more risk, they'd feel more comfortable talking about that. And I do think that's important too, especially when there's something Mm -hmm. that you can do about it, like Mm -hmm. surgical, surgical options and things like that. So yeah, certainly I had a patient not too long ago that was told that they were at higher risk and that surgery could be an option, but they were very worried about you know, side Mm -hmm. effects of surgery, sometimes Mm -hmm. very, very bad side effects like blindness Mm -hmm. and things like that. And so, but it was nice that I was so well versed in SUDEP that it didn't throw me for a loop that I felt like I could help that family and give that family a little bit of guidance on that Mm -hmm. choice. When Mm -hmm. I feel like, honestly, probably a lot of general pediatricians wouldn't have. And I don't know if before I did the podcast, if I would have been able to, well, I'm certain I wouldn't have been able to counsel them in the same way after Mm -hmm. having met so many families who've lost their kids. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that that's good or bad because obviously my, (laughs) I have a very skewed sense of much higher of the rates of suit up than they actually are, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when I interview people, their children have died. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, that it's hard. I, we were just on a little trip and I was talking to my son about somebody. And I said, well, I was talking to her, her son died. And, and he's like, yeah, everybody you talk to, their kid has died. Like, yeah, I know. I know. I've been, that's now so many of my friends are in this mm-hmm. same world, even though it's yeah. still rare. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I know they're, you know, one of the foundations I work with is really trying to get the technology kind of industry moving. And there's a couple of things, there's one or two that are FDA approved for seizure detection, but of course they monitor just gross motor movement a lot of the times, but there are things that can connect to smartphones and just kind of alert. So it's not perfect and it's not a hundred percent, but it, it can be a very good part of a treatment plan. Mm-hmm. You know, the, and the best way to avoid that from happening is just seizure control. And unfortunately, I think there's upwards of 30% of people with epilepsy do not obtain seizure control. And that's the biggest risk. Um, you know, every seizure, especially in the tonic clinic is a risk for something to happen, whether it be that or an accident or a accidental drowning or, you know, anything like that. So yeah, yeah. or a status situation. So, so I think. Yeah. Just finding hopefulness in my story, especially when I talk to other families with epilepsy, you know, it's not always the best segue to say, Hey, you know, my son had epilepsy, but he died, you know, so just finding ways and outlets that I can help use my voice and, and create some of that hope. Um, and I feel like I've been able to do that in Brendan's memory through these two foundations and my daughter's got involved. um, Ivy's gotten involved and, you know, in giving and fundraising. So that's been a really great opportunity for her. I want her as we know, as our kids grow older, they're going to develop through their grief and as their developmental capacity can embrace that. And I want her to have a community of people that she can go for resources and a better understanding of what actually happened to Brendan along with, you know, church community, family community, that kind of thing. So it's been a real blessing for us to have her in her, you know, she's only eight years old to kind of be surrounded by, she sees people who are, that look different, you know, they're in wheelchairs, they don't speak, they have different ways of communicating. So she's being exposed to a lot of other people that have various disabilities and, you know, working to support them. So that's pretty special for us too. So talk to us a little bit about those two foundations and kind of what your role has been in both of those. Yeah. So my first encounter with the Epilepsy Foundation of Iowa, when Brendan passed away, his roommate found him that afternoon and they suspect that he had been, he had died hours earlier during a nap during in the morning, his roommate came back from class and Brendan was still in bed and found him. And he tried to administer CPR, but Brendan he had been gone a very long time. So very traumatic kind of experience for a 18, 19 year old to find their roommate, you know, unresponsive. 
And then of course he was in the dorm room and a lot of his neighboring, a lot of the people that were in his, on his floor were his friends. And so they were a part of seeing all of them, you know, him being wheeled out in the stretcher, in this body bag. And I think one of the first things after we were notified by the police officers in Decorah, they came to our door that night and we were just getting ready. My daughters and I'm kind of regressing here, but my daughters and I were getting ready to go on a trip to New York. And so we had just booked our, our uh, hotel in Minneapolis because we were going to leave on a flight at 5 a.m. So we wanted to stay overnight, park our car there. And I just shut my computer down um, from booking the hotel and got a knock on our front door. And there stood two decor police officers. And the one said to me, um, are you Brendan's mom? And I said, yes. And I thought, oh gosh, did he get in a car accident? Did he get in trouble? And I knew he was at school. And he said, I'm so sorry, your son passed away today. I just went to my knees. Yeah. I didn't start crying immediately. I went to my knees and then my husband knelt down. I sat on his knee and I was just in disbelief. I didn't even start crying. Yeah. I don't think I cried for another hour. I just couldn't believe all I could muster. My daughter was with, um, my oldest daughter was with my youngest in the back room and they kind of peeked around the corner and my husband sent him upstairs to go be with Maya and you know, didn't say much, but they knew something was happening. And all I wanted to do was shut that door and have them come back and say, you know what, we just made a big mistake. It wasn't your son. Right. And they didn't know a lot about what had happened because the Ames police where Iowa state is had just notified them, the investigator and said, here, here's a number they can call and we'll give them more details. So they had no idea what had happened. And they came in the door and they stood for a while. And I remember the first thing, and I think sadness brings you a lot of guilt And that was my first response. I said to them, I am so sorry that this is something you have to do. Telling a mom that you lost your child. That was my first thought. Mm -hmm. And because I had no, I didn't know what else to think. Right. So they left and we proceeded to make our contacts and kind of find out more, but then we needed to get a hold of people because, you know, with social media, his friends right there, we didn't want anyone to find out through any of that. So I have a very hard time re- reliving and talking about the next two hours. We had to call his girlfriend. We had to tell his sisters. We had to tell his grandparents, his family. And all along, I kept thinking my son is somewhere in a cold bag in a medical examiner's room and I'm not with him. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want to go see him because he wasn't, that was not him anymore. He is, his life had left his body and I wasn't about to go kneel on a floor in a medical examiner's you know, room and be with my son. So I had to talk myself down and, you know, he was an organ donor and of course with his brown eyes and they said, you know, he could donate his corneas. I know the irises are part of the, the ones that make the color, but I was just, it was kind of a little sliver of silver lining. So I was on the phone for 45 minutes shortly after with the organ donating, donating interviewer and answering all these very personal questions about Brendan. Was he sexually active? Was he a drug user? Was he this, that, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, these are intense, but no, 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 you know, that I knew of. And it turned out that they couldn't draw enough blood. So he was, they weren't able to harvest his skin or his bones or his corneas or anything to use um, to donate. So the next morning I got that call and that was kind of disappointing, but yeah. Yeah. So anyways, getting back to the foundation, his roommate's mom, um, which was very special, started the team for our epilepsy walk um, that following spring. And that kind of catapulted me into connecting with the foundation, the executive director. And then a year later, she introduced me or she said, you need to get in contact with the Danny Did Foundation. So I started connecting with them. I'd been volunteering at the epilepsy walks in Iowa at the remembrance tables and things like that. And so I had already kind of gotten my feet grounded on Mm -hmm. a little bit of support, you know, and what that looks like, how I was able to absorb that and, um, kind of fit that into my own grief. And so I saw that the Danny did foundation was taking in team members for the Chicago marathon, which is one of their big fundraisers. And I have run marathons in the past. And so I thought, Hmm, okay, that's interesting. Or it's, you know, it kind of gets me interested, but then the time frame to sign up passed. And I thought, okay, well, decisions made. And then they extended the deadline. So I asked my husband, I said, would you support me if I ran a marathon? 
And he said, well, I thought you were never going to run a marathon again. And I said, well, here's what it would be for. And he said, absolutely. And within five minutes, he had a training schedule pulled up for me. And I ran my first marathon with Danny did in 2019. And when I made my first call to Danny is a four-year-old boy who died from SUDEP 10 years earlier. And his family had started this foundation to bring awareness. Um, his uncle was the executive director. So he was my first phone call. And you know, when you have that listening heart, you know, he's been through this as an uncle of somebody who was lost in the same way as Brendan. And from there, I just felt like just a, such a heartfelt connection that I knew I needed yeah. to be a part of that foundation. Today, I'm on the board of directors for both the Epilepsy Foundation of Iowa. I'm the suit up, direct, or up ambassador for Iowa. So I have the opportunity to connect with other bereaved families across the state that have similar losses and work with researchers. Um, like at the University of Iowa, they have a huge suit up research team. So that's been fun to kind of get involved with kind of finding out why this happens. Mm-hmm. And then also I'm on the board of directors now too with the Danny Did Foundation. So that's been kind of my my heart work, um, in memory of Brendan. And, um, I love both the teams I work with and all the people that I get to meet nationally that are affected by this condition. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's pretty amazing, very bittersweet. Yeah. But it does give it a little bit of purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I don't know how much time we have left, but I was going to share, I went to New York. So our, we canceled our trip. We ended up making the trip a year later, the girls and I, but I went to New York that spring in 2018, right after our first epilepsy walk, I had two girlfriends from college or from high school that I went with and I walked through central park and there were these beautiful pink trees that were blooming. I thought they were like crab apple trees. I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I don't know. Yeah. And I got closer and they were these huge, beautiful like multi, a ton of trees, all blooming. They were magnolias, pink magnolia trees. Uh Didn't know that. Well, it just so happened that that very day, that morning, my parents and my daughter Ivy were down at Iowa state. His friends were planting a pink flowering magnolia tree in front of his dorm at Iowa state. And my parents were down there to be part of the dedication. Wow. And here I am walking through Central Park with these magnolia, these beautiful magnolia trees everywhere. And I just sat there and I just watched people walk by and I looked at these beautiful trees and I just imagined how beautiful that tree was going to become outside of his dorm yeah. in a few years. And yeah, we have a little magnolia tree. I mean, it's getting me teary eyed because we have a little magnolia tree in behind our house up north. And of course, it blooms right around his birthday every year because his birthday is at the end of April. But the weird thing about this magnolia tree, and I don't know, maybe there are other magnolia trees that do this. I've never seen one that does this. But our magnolia tree also will bloom about 10 or 15 blooms also in the middle of August. And it has mm-hmm. always done this. And it's mm-hmm. always just a few, just a handful. Yes. But it, Mm-hmm. is in the middle of August. And I don't know really why it does it. I don't know. Do, is that common? Do you know? I don't know. But for Mother's Day, the following year, my husband bought me six magnolia. They came like just bare root mm-hmm. and um, we planted them all over. But they're starting to do the same thing because we're now kind of getting into the third year. Um, and that's kind of yeah. when they really start to. But yeah, they do. We'll see little buds and it won't, like you said, it doesn't, it's not many. It doesn't but a lot, just- but it does it. And, and well, and what's crazy is, you know, so Andy died on August 15th. And so it's it so that magnolia tree blooms for his birthday and then it blooms again just a little bit right around his oh, second day. That's so special. I know it just hmm, definitely is definitely a sign. A god wink, <laughs> yeah. a shoulder tap, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. And maybe all magnolia trees do that. <laughs> it sounds like maybe they do, but it just seems a little special, at least for this one. Well that it does that just how would you have known? How no. would you have known that? No, because you're right. I had never really seen magnolia trees in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. But we're just a little bit further east in Michigan and we've got, we've got them. So. Yeah. Oh. Well, I know when we talked a couple of weeks ago, I could not end our conversation without showing gratitude for both of our children and the love that we have for them. The love that's driven you to this amazing platform to be kind of a a speaking point for just a lot of grieving families and people listening and everything. And I am so honored to be able to be a part of it, but we would not be sitting here today if it weren't for our children, if it weren't for Andy and if it weren't for Brendan. And I know we would hands down, we wouldn't want to be here today 
Yep. But this, you know, with our circumstances, I just, I'm grateful that our sons have brought us together here and that your son, the love of your son has given you this platform and your voice to really help people heal. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Jen. <laughs> yeah. I just look forward to seeing all that you're going to be able to accomplish too. Yeah. Well, I look forward to listening to all of your podcasts. I know it's bittersweet because that means, you know, moms are, you know, or dads are losing their children, obviously, but it does, it does help when you hear other people's stories and you hear how they're moving on, you know, whether they're going on to teach yoga or do different foundations, it's very inspiring to just see how people are able to take that next step forward in a world without children. Well, and hopefully it gives people just a little bit of hope for the future. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful and would like to support the podcast, please leave a five-star rating and comment. To help financially, you can text Andy's mom to the number 53555 or visit the donate page on andysmom.com. Your donations are secure and tax deductible, and we are now able to accept Venmo, PayPal, and Apple Pay. Always Andy's Mom is a registered 501c3 organization and can receive donations through smile.amazon.com, Thrive in Financial, and Benevity, amongst others. Marcy loves hearing from listeners. Please feel free to reach out to her via email at marcy at andysmom.com. Also, be sure to sign up for the email list to receive weekly updates as well as pictures of all of Marcy's guests and their children. Together, let's work to inspire hope one day at a time.